Welcome and thank you for joining us here at Life Central. If you want to know more about who we are and what we're all about, check out our website, lifecentral.org.za or like, follow and subscribe to our social media channels. We hope this message speaks into your life and that you will find meaning and purpose through it, guiding you through your daily life. Hi folks, good to be with you this morning. Thank you to the team at Life Central for giving me an opportunity to share God's word with you guys and thanks to the team behind the cameras this morning. Before I get into this message, I want you to remember this little piece of press stick that I got and it's going to play a significant role in illustrating the point of the sermon this morning. I've called this message Recognizing God's Ways and the scripture that I'd like to share to lay a foundation is from Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8 to 9 and it's coming from the NLT second edition. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of getting together around your word and just talking about it and discussing it so freely. Thank you, Lord God, that you move beyond the limitations of my speech and that you're watching over your word to perform it. Lord, we trust that you achieve your purposes in people's hearts, that people learn to love you more and become more like Jesus as a result of our time spent around your word this morning. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. There comes a time in our lives when we're expecting God to answer our prayers in a certain way. And we end up not recognizing his answer because our expectations are very different from his. I remember years ago, once I'd started my walk with the Lord, I'd read in the Bible about people hearing God's voice. And I'd interact with more mature Christians than myself. And they'd speak about God said this and I said that and I heard the Lord say this and I heard the Lord say that. And folks, to be honest with you, I was truly intrigued with that and just captivated my imagination and my attention. And I wanted to be one of those guys, one of those Christians that hear from the Lord and be able to say, I heard God and I sensed God and I felt God prompt me to say this. And I started on a journey where I became desperate to hear the voice of the Lord. And I remember in my small little pea brain thinking that God is going to speak to me like this, that I'd be in my room, I'd be in one of those super spiritual modes, and I'd hear the Lord say, Mozzie. This is your father speaking. And I expected the wind to come into the room and the curtains to blow. <clears throat> and it wasn't like that. And I eventually got to learn that God speaks to me, and I'm sure to most of us, in the voice we listen to the most and the voice we recognize the quickest. Any guesses as to whose that is? Well, it's yours. It's your voice and it's my voice. God speaks to us in what sounds like our voice, obviously with his profound wisdom, with his insight, and it, it's things that Jesus would say and stuff that lines up with the scripture. And then already I learned that our expectations of how God answers prayers and how God speaks is oftentimes very different to what we expect. And without going into a long list of it this morning, I know of eight different ways in which God speaks to us. And because he's a loving, caring father, and because we are hard of hearing, he always uses at least two ways to speak to us, to confirm his word through the mouths of two or more witnesses in various ways. So I'm not going to go into the list of ways that God speaks to us, but I'm going to look at examples this morning from the scripture about how people were expecting God to speak in a certain way, and he ended up speaking in a different way. And when that happens, we miss God's timing and we miss what God is trying to say. We might get to the point where we think, well, God is not answering my prayers. In the meantime, you, you, you're waiting for heaven, God, to do something. And God is just waiting for you to take that step of faith because you hear. For those of you that are parents, I know sometimes when you speak to your children, you'll say, Johnny, clean your room. Johnny says, yes, Dad, I'll do it. And the time period given for Johnny to clean his room comes and goes. And Johnny doesn't clean his room. You've got to raise your voice. You say, Johnny, clean your room. Yes, Dad, I'm going to get to it. And that time period goes again. And you know what happens? Johnny doesn't clean his room. 
And the third time, Dad speaks, says, Johnny! And it's a thunderous roar to get Johnny's attention. And Johnny still doesn't clean his room. Folks, sometimes with God, it's completely the opposite. God speaks once, clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, so that you know because you know God has spoken. Johnny, do X, Y, Z. And Johnny's disobedient. And the next time God speaks, it's, Johnny, do X, Y, Z. And Johnny's disobedient. And the third time, it's a gentle, gentle whisper. Because we become callous and our conscience becomes seared in hearing the things of God. Let's look at some examples from Scripture where people were expecting God to speak in a certain way and he ended up speaking in a different way. Remember our piece of pre Elijah is running, running away after he hears that Jezebel wants to kill him. He has a major victory where he challenges the prophets of Baal. And if you read in scripture, they summon fire down from heaven. and The prophets of Baal pray and they do all sorts of things, incantations and cut themselves to get the attention of their false dead gods. Needless to say, nothing was going to happen. And Elijah says, right, I'm going to show you now. And he calls down fire from heaven. He gets them to wet the altar and to build a water trough around it. Calls down fire from heaven, burns the sacrifice and burns all the prophets in the same time. So he experiences a major, major breakthrough. And then little Mrs. Jezebel poses a threat to Elijah and Elijah runs. That's the background. 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 9 to 13. This is Elijah. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. Friend, have you gotten to a place where you feel like perhaps you're the only one that's doing what's right? I know it's like that with me in the traffic. When it's me in the traffic, everybody in front of me is a slow coach. Everyone who overtakes me is a maniac. I am the only one that's going the ideal speed. Yeah, it's not like it. Elijah says, I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. God says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. My brother, my sister, are you expecting God to speak to you in a whirlwind, in an earthquake, in a fire? Maybe he has spoken like that and you haven't heard or recognized it or expected him to speak to you like that. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Verse 13 says, when Elijah heard it, then only he heard it. So did he not hear what was going on those other times? No, because God was not speaking to him through that. It says, he wrapped his face, his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And he had to get up and go to face another day again and to keep on keeping on. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah. So God was not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in a still, small voice. Is God speaking to you in a way you're not recognizing? Another example of somebody missing the way God speaks. Naaman had an expectation of how he was going to be healed. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. And Naaman did achieved significant stuff in battles and in victory. He was like a manier, the bee's knees. So I think perhaps he had a sense of entitlement and expectancy for God to heal him in a certain way. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house, the great prophet Elisha. But Elisha sent a message out to him with this message. He didn't even go and see the dude personally. He just sent a messenger. Not disrespectful, that's just the way it went down. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed 
of your leprosy. We know that leprosy is a type and a kind of or a shadow of sin. So Naaman was being used of God and had a measure of success in his life, but there was this thing in his life. I wonder what is the leprosy in your life, my brother, my sister, that God wants to speak into this morning. So it tells him, go down to the river, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. He speak about the prophet Elisha now. I expected him to wave his hand. That's like the charismatic thing. Hallelujah. To wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of the Lord his God and heal me. I imagine that it must have been very humbling for Naaman to wash himself in the river. Just read on in the Bible what happens. He goes and he does just that. And guess what, folks? He comes out healed. So there's two factors here to Naaman's breakthrough. First of all, humility. He had to humble himself and go wash in the simple old Jordan River. And not once, not twice, but seven times. And then obedience. So he had to have humility and obedience for him to experience his breakthrough and healing in his life. Jesus tells the people that they can recognize the weather, but not the signs of the times. In Matthew 16, verse 1 to 3, one day the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he showed them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. <laughs> How's the audacity of that, guys? It's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the couldn't sees, and the wouldn't sees, and the refused to sees. Uh, they demand from Jesus, like we demand to prove your authority as if his authority needed justification or authentic proof. There was a time that Jesus says, you know, if you don't believe my claims because of what I say, just believe in me because of the miraculous works that I do. Why could he say that? Because before him, folks, nobody had ever done or seen anything like that and or spoken like Jesus did. And he said, you're battling to believe me. Just look at the fruit in my life. And these guys demand a sign from Jesus, the audacity. And Jesus replied, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. How many folks are at a place where we quickly and very easily believe media? before we believe the scriptures. So if a person has a website and you've seen it on the internet, and even if you've read it on Wikipedia, well, it must be so because I found it on the internet without us making the time to, to research it and check it out ourselves. There's very, very valuable, helpful sites where you can go and check the authenticity of certain claims. I know one of them is Snopes.com, I think it is, and the other one is GotQuestions.org. The latter one is Christian-based. I don't know about Snopes, but they, they, it's, it's a fact-checking group of people that go and check the authenticity of facts. So we see something and we quickly, quickly spread the rumor. I read it, yeah, or I saw it there. We say, hey, have you heard? Or we become part of the they and we say, they say, well, um, I'm not the oldest of folks around, but I've been living long enough to wonder who are the they? Where are the they? Those folks that say these things. So Jesus says, you can interpret all the signs of the weather. You're not even recognizing the signs of the times. What were the times? The time of their visitation. The time of the fulfillment of the prophecies where him, the fulfillment of their prophecies, Jesus, God in the flesh, God amongst men, Emmanuel, came to them to set them free and they could experience freedom and liberty by just believing in him. And they didn't recognize him, guys and ladies, to the point where they crucified him, to the point where they said, no, rather give us Barabbas, rather give us the condemned criminal than our Lord and our Savior. Talk about missing the boat, just not getting it, not seeing what God is saying. What were they expecting? They were expecting a mighty king to come and topple the, the oppressive government of the day. I'll be the first to raise my hand this morning and say, there's times I've, I've prayed like, Lord, 
You know, we should be praying for the government. I've, I've prayed for them. I've prayed like Psalm 109 and verse 8. Let their days be short and not take their place. Instead of praying in all sincerity, Lord, may they come to saving knowledge of Jesus before Satan steals their lives. You see, folks, even though platforms of authority are not exercised in a godly way, the scripture teaches that all authority, all authority, including the authorities in this nation, have been given by God. Yes, they're not exercised in a godly way. They were expecting Jesus to come and be like David and just topple the government of the day and establish the rule and reign of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. It did not happen like that. What did he do? Their prayers were not answered like they wanted. He came and he taught them to live in the midst of that mess. You see, they were praying for the storm to stop where life was about learning to dance in the rain. There's a time when Jesus showed the miraculous and came walking to the disciples on the boat, uh, um, on the water in the boat. And if they hadn't experienced that, they wouldn't have seen that dynamic aspect inside of the nature of Jesus as well. To the point where they'd wonder, who's this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. I submit to you folks, sometimes God allows us to get in situations where we can't phone the prayer chain and get them to pray for us or our care group, our life group our home cell, our church, our leadership. There comes a time where we're going to have to find an intimate connection with the Lord ourselves and for us to experience what I, call, what, what I like to call our personal Gethsemane. What's that? Jesus was alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he needed his support structure, his circle of friends around him, they were busy sleeping. And he had to have intimacy with the Father alone. There's going to come a time where we are going to need that. God will do whatever it takes for us to get there because then we'll, our character and our Christ-likeness will grow more and more. So Jesus tells them, you recognize the signs of the times. You're not even recognizing the time of the visitation of your Savior. So the question I'd like us to ask ourselves this morning is, in what ways could God be working in South Africa that we perhaps are not recognizing? Think about that, folks. You know, if we factually speaking, look at what's happen happening around us. There's factually very little to look forward to. But if we believe the scriptures that says that the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth, that includes South Africa, yes, it includes us, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. If we really believe that this is not a, people speak about this tip of Africa as God forsaken, there's no such place as God forsaken. There are people who have forsaken God, but there's not a God forsaken place. Folks, what lessons is God wanting to teach his church in South Africa here in this time here and now? The scripture says that God has pre-appointed the times and the deaths and, and the borders of where we live. I think it's Acts 17 and verse 26. Not 100% sure on that reference, but check that verse out. Now God has predetermined where we live. Do you really believe that God has got you here and now in South Africa for a time such as this to make a difference? We're children of light, right? Where are we called to be light? We're not called to be light in the light. We're called to be light in the darkness. And I wonder, what is God saying to me? In what way is he speaking to me that I'm perhaps not recognizing and not hearing what he's saying? What is God saying to you? In what way? Are you not recognizing his voice? Luke 19 and verse 44. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Folks, is the church of Jesus Christ going to be that statistic in South Africa? In the award ceremony in heaven, a great judgment, not the great white throne judgment is several judgments spoken of in the scripture i'm talking about the one where we get rewarded according to the deeds we've done here what are we going to say as the church of jesus christ one of the judgments is the judgment of nations when south africa the church of jesus christ in south africa is judged what are we going to say yeah but lord it became difficult when we say well i didn't recognize lord sorry i missed you lord i was waiting for this i was waiting for that reminds me of that incident where a particular town was hit by floods and a believer was trusting God to come and rescue him. And the flood waters were outside his house. And a boat came by and said, we had a rescue. And he says, no, I'm trusting God. And the water rose. 
and he had to stand on the roof and another boat came by and he said, come, come, we want to rescue you. He says, no, I'm trusting God. And the water rose even further and he was on the very top of his roof. And I said, come, we got to rescue you. He says, no, I'm trusting God. He trusted God to send a helicopter. That guy became a statistic. He ended up becoming fish food because he didn't recognize the three ways in which God sent for his deliverance and his salvation. God will sometimes use the most unlikely people and unlikely circumstances to speak into our lives. He's used a donkey. Who is he using to speak into your life? Perhaps it's that person that you don't like too much. You don't really like to hear what they want to say because almost always when they speak it's the truth and the truth hurts a little bit. Perhaps the truth is demanding change that you're not quite ready to let take place in your life yet. So God will use strange people, strange circumstances. What will help us understand these things is remembering that God is always wanting us to grow and become more like Jesus. God is always up to something, and it's always up to something good. His motive always was, always will be love. Love for you, for us to become like Jesus. John 12, verse 28 to 29. Jesus says, Father, bring glory to your name. And then a voice spoke from heaven. One voice spoke from heaven. I've already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. And when the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Can you see how different people are different places in their lives? Some heard thunder, others declared it an angel to have spoken. And one voice was heard and they had different ideas as to who or what had happened. What are we to do then in order to recognize God's ways, God's voice, and God's timing in our lives? I don't know about you, but I don't want to live for a God who I never hear, who I never receive communication from. And dialogue with God is just that. Talking to God is not me waking up in the morning, coming with my shopping list before God. I tell him what I want, when I want it, how I want him to give it, and I usually want it yesterday. A living, loving relationship with a living God is dialogue where we make the time to sit down, shut up, and listen to what he has to say to us, to be still and to know that he is God. So what are we to do? The key is having a mind shift and a change of heart. Romans 12 and verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. Lost scripture and then I'm done. And I'll get to our little piece of press stick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we. There's an emphasis. But we. That's God's children. Born again men, women and children of God who live like Jesus and love like Jesus. Who follow hard after Jesus. But we understand these things for we have the mind of christ so to summarize and to recap god speaks in ways that we sometimes do not understand god will use circumstances and people from the most unlikely places that we perhaps will not recognize and for us to understand these things and to recognize god's voice we need to believe that god is always up to something and it's always for our good and then to have a change of mind and a change of art, and to hold on to this promise in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. Before, before I started sharing with you folks this morning, I grabbed hold of this piece of prestic. This piece of prestic is pretty much like us. This piece of prestic just had to be soft, pliable, and malleable in my hands. It has no clue what shape I have in my mind and what I want it to look like at the end of this message. And our life is like that, folks. We must willingly and gladly place our hands and our lives, our lives, sorry, in the hands of the potter and let him shape us and mold us and change us. Are you a little bit square and set in your ways? And God wants to just smooth those rough edges a little bit so that you can get on in life a little bit better? Or are you so round and smooth and so cool that you roll uphill and God wants you just to conform to his ways a little bit? Are there parts of the old you that God perhaps 
doesn't like because it just doesn't look and sound and act like Jesus. And he wants to do away with it and change you into somebody that is more like Jesus. Or has the devil stolen, killed and destroyed so much in your life that God wants to add and complement your life and bring you blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Thank you for making the time to join us this morning. I trust that if you allow him, God will challenge you and help you to understand that God's ways are not our ways and recognizing God's ways will get us well on our way to stepping into the kingdom things that he has for us. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May God lift up his countenance over you and give you supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. Take care and have a great week.